Hey there, Dan Quillen, physical therapist, uh, medically licensed athletic trainer, and orthopedic clinical specialist. And I am excited here today. I've had lots of patients asking me questions about nutrition constantly. And I finally reached out to somebody and thought I'd give it a whirl here doing an interview. I have on here Kylie Keller, who has a master's in science. She's a res registered dietitian and a licensed dietitian, but I'm going to let her tell you what that means exactly. Uh, go ahead, Kylie. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Um, as Dan said, my name is Kylie Keller. I am a registered dietitian. Um, I currently work at Hayes Medical Center as a clinical dietitian, but I also own K-Squared Performance Nutrition. Um, so a little bit about myself. I went to school at K-State. Um, I've always been into athletics. I did athletics all through high school, uh, did it in college, and it's kind of how I know Dan through his wife. We were on the rowing team together at K-State. Um, but when I graduated from K-State with my degree in dietetics, it was essentially you were going to be a clinical dietitian, you would work in food service, or you would work in community. Um, so I just thought I was going to be a clinical dietitian for the rest of my life. And then sports nutrition started to be, become a bigger thing, was on the rise. And K-State actually hired their first full-time nutrition person. And so I got in contact with him and was fortunate that I was able to be a grad assistant at K-State. So I left my clinical job at the time and went back to school to get my master's while also working as a grad assistant. So during that time, I helped out with all teams at K-State, all their nutrition needs. Um, I was hopeful that it would turn into a full-time position, but unfortunately it didn't. So from there, I managed where all the student athletes ate. We called it performance table. Um, it's essentially a student athlete cafeteria, but I managed that solely for three years. And then for the last three and a half, four years I was there, I did that. And I was also the team dietitian for volleyball, baseball, and rowing. So I handled all of their individual nutrition needs, their pre and post game meals, helped with road travel. I did do some travel with baseball. Uh, they were the team that had me pretty, pretty involved with what they were doing. And then any other nutrition things they had, it, it came through me. And so sports has always been my, my love, I guess. And that's where I excel. Uh, but clinical also keeps me on my toes with the latest and it helps me in sports. So that's why I also started my private practice. Um, part of it also was I moved away from K-State, moved away from athletics when I got married. Um, and so I still wanted to do that. So that's kind of where my career has, has led me to this point. Um, so in terms of what exactly do I do as a dietitian, uh, from a performance standpoint, it's I'll have athletes reach out to me that are either wanting to gain weight, lose weight, maybe maintain where they're at, but they want to increase muscle mass um, or they're just not happy where their performance is at. And so what I like to do is just look at from a nutrition standpoint, what are they doing? Um, and nine times out of 10, it's a deficiency of not taking in enough. Um, and that's a common misconception with athletes, especially when they want to lose weight is I'm just not going to eat as much and that's going to help me lose weight. However, it usually negatively impacts their performance and their energy level. Um, and so it's really educating on what foods they need to eat and how it does affect their performance um, and what we need to incorporate. Sometimes it's lack of hydration, it's sleep. Sometimes there's other factors too that we have to take into account. So I'll do an initial assessment, give a couple recommendations and then follow up from there and see what's working, what's not working. And um, again, it depends on the situation. Sometimes it's more involved than other times. Um, but then other things too is maybe doing team presentations to answer a whole group of questions similar to kind of what we're doing here, only it would be in a team setting. Um, so really nutrition, you can do a lot of things. I've also done grocery store tours and I've done cooking classes as well. And a lot of that is the grocery store is especially the younger population doesn't necessarily know how to navigate the grocery store. Uh, we had athletes come to K-State that had never been to the grocery store, or didn't even know what to look for. Interesting. And so just going through the store and showing them some budget saving tips and what to look for. And then from a cooking standpoint, I also like to approach it as I want to teach life skills. So one thing that I do tell a lot of athletes is, especially if you're, if they're in the college level or even at the high school level, and they don't know if they're going on to the college level, they're provided a meal at school. Um, 
maybe they're, you know, working out heavily, they can use the weight equipment at school, all of that stuff is provided. That's not going to be there when they're done with their career, but food is always going to be there. And so teaching those simple life skills of how do you read a recipe, how to make simple things so you're not always eating out. And so nutrition is really more than just what do you eat every day? Um, So that's the other aspect that I like to pull into it too, is the life skills and how is it going to help past the end of their career. So is that kind of what you mostly do with K2 is everything you just listed there? Uh, and you have people reaching out to you and just going through all the different things you talked about? Yeah, it's been mostly individual consultations. I've done a few team presentations, um, done a few things with Fort Hayes women's basketball. Um, and they also had a, they called it well um, wellness nights or something. I can't remember what it was called, um, but each week they had a different topic. And I did a couple of presentations with them in terms of just general nutrition just because I was talking to all different sports Um, and that's the other thing to keep in mind too that the recommendations or ideas that I will give in our conversation are very broad and so it's going to vary based on individual what the situation is if it's a football player versus a basketball player as well so that is something to keep in mind is what I'm what I'm giving tonight is very broad Um, and so if you feel like it's not a fit for you that's where the individualization comes in. Great. I mean, that's kind of neat to reach out to a division two or have a division two um, athletic program reach out to you, especially when you branched out on your own. I know mm-hmm. living, what are you, three hours from Manhattan now, roughly? Two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half, not too far up, but yeah, um, that's awesome. Um, so you you said you also mentioned you work at, at Hayes Med and then mm-hmm. do you just provide dietary recommendations inside the hospital. Yeah, we see inpatient and we see outpatient. Uh, We also have a bariatric surgeon, so we also see those patients as well. And so it's a lot of nutrition assessment. Honestly, there's, I would say, depending on the day, sometimes it's 50% of the patients are going to want some sort of education. Other days, I may be covering more of ICU and I may not be able to talk to a single one of them. And so it's providing nutrition support recommendations. So each day is a little different there, but like I said, the clinical knowledge helps me in the performance setting because I've worked with athletes that are diabetic and I have athletes that have GI issues. And without the clinical experience, it's hard to really help those athletes the best that you can because we don't have that knowledge. I mean, I'm kind of hearing, it's like, I tell people out here in rural Kansas, because my clinic's in Great Bend, Kansas, and which is the middle of nowhere, and doctors are like, oh, what do you specialize in? you're like, everything? (laughs) And so you kind of get stuck with this avenue of managing and dealing with everything, and it's Mm -hmm. it's exciting to have another medical professional uh, dealing with that, because it's like, you know, the next text message or phone call could be totally off kilter. And I think, I don't know, after about five or six years, I started being better at answering questions and dealing with it. And it sounds like you're deep into that and figuring all that out. That's awesome. Yep. Yep. It's something different all the time. Well, I had, I tried to get a list of stuff together. I had some patients give me some input. Um, one thing in particular I deal with a lot of is surgeries. And so some patients had questions about what should I eat the week before surgery, two weeks before surgery, does it impact how my outcome will be on the surgery? And I know that's a really specific topic, but I wasn't sure if you had any input on dietary recommendations before or around that surgery time. Yeah. So depending on if it's a planned surgery versus it's an injury, uh, one thing I would suggest is if it's an injury um, and you know, you're going to have to have surgery as soon as you can, right after injury occurs, I would suggest incorporating some omega-3 or yeah, omega-3s. Um, so like adding in more salmon, avocados, walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds. Um, if you don't like any of those foods, it's okay to do the fish oil as well. Um, but those are all shown to help decrease inflammation. So again, depending on the extent of the injury, obviously inflammation usually has to be, has to exit the body before surgery can be performed. So that is something that can help is to start incorporating those. The other thing too, regardless of planned or unplanned surgery is your energy needs actually increase when your body is in the injured state. So that is another common misconception is I'm having surgery, I can't eat as much. So I'm just gonna eat very little, I'm gonna skip meals. And that's actually the opposite of what you want. 
So when your body is in that injured state or even right after surgery, our energy needs increase because our body is trying to reproduce, our body is trying to recover. So if you're someone that you don't have a very well-balanced intake, I encourage you to start increasing fruit and vegetable intake. Um, as well as looking at, are my protein sources lean or am I doing something that's more fatty? Do we do a lot of fried foods um, versus grilled, baked, or broiled? And then trying to add in whole grains as well. So the whole grains are also going to give some fiber, which is good for heart health and GI health as well. Um, but if you can give, I mean, if you can start doing a good balanced intake, aiming for three meals a day, that would be ideal to help prepare you for surgery as best that you can. Um, as far as, you know, like a week out, one day out, there's not really going to be a difference there in what, in terms of what that looks like. It's just, can you get a good balance and can you get a good variety leading up to surgery so that your body has already got a little bit of a jump start in making sure that you're providing what it needs for your body to heal. So I'm lazy and I'm busy and I got so much going on and I got the surgery coming up. I'm at the doctor's, you know, I'm at my regular job, got to go to the doctor's office and get all the stuff done and prepped. What's the most efficient way for me to get all that stuff in? Um, let's go logistics there with like, how can I be quick about it, but still do a good job and not um, come at it from a bad angle. Right. Uh, that is a question I get a lot is I don't have a lot of time. Um, part of it, which I know this it's, it's last minute, you don't really know this is happening, but you can meal prep to help prepare for it. But there's also different easy overnight recipes, or we can throw things in the crock pot so that it's ready when we get home. And we can also, um, I believe there's a question on here about supplements a little bit later on that we'll touch on, but we can also incorporate a protein shake and whether it's that's a breakfast option or it ends up being a lunch option, depending on what your schedule looks like. Those are also okay too. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that part till we get to the supplements just because I have more information on that. But sure. that is something sure. that is absolutely okay. Um, and then like fruits and vegetables, we can mix those into smoothies. Um, and those are easy things that can be prepared ahead of time. Um, or you can make something called a smoothie pack and you put all the fruit and vegetable together for the smoothie in a Ziploc bag. And then all you have to do is add the liquid and blend it the next day, whether it's breakfast or lunch or whatever that is. A lot of it's more preparing on the back end when we have a busy lifestyle versus I'm just not going to do it. Um, and it does take a little bit of time and I understand it's a change, uh, but I really encourage people just to take an extra five to 10 minutes just to implement that change because I promise it does pay off. I'm staring at myself here because this is me at the clinic all day long. So I was kind of playing devil's advocate. Imagine that any, like anything else, if you prep a little bit and you do the extra steps, things tend to go a little bit better in life. Uh, so kind of mm -hmm. going out of your way to do the right things is kind of what I'm hearing. Yes, correct. Yep. Like I said, I know it takes a little bit of time, but again, if you're somebody that's not used to doing that, what I like to work on is let's make gradual changes versus leave the meeting and I need to change everything that we talked about. That's where I set one or two goals and we work on that. And if it is, hey, I need to be better about eating breakfast. Okay, let's talk about simple things that can be made ahead of time or what are quick and easy things that I can grab and go and it's going to help me get breakfast versus me saying, I don't have time. And then you at K2 um, performance can provide a lot of that help. If people really feel stranded and trapped, they can reach out to you and do all that. Yep. Yep. And I have plenty of recipe ideas I can provide too. Awesome. I figured. Um, cool. Uh, the kind of the next thing I had on the list that maybe you've touched on is after surgery, what types of food and qualities and quantity of food. And maybe that's the same answer. Yeah. So after surgery, again, common misconception is I don't need to eat because I'm not able to be as active, for example. And again, opposite is true. We need more. So what exactly would that look like from a food standpoint? Um, I'm going to show you a picture here of what we want your or what what we're aiming for your plate to look like initially. And how do we let me see here? For some reason it's not showing up on my um, how, how do I incorporate everything that I need? So this here, this here is going to give you a little bit of an idea of a good starting point. So what we want to aim for is at least a quarter of your plate is your carbohydrates or your grains. They do not always have to be whole grain. 
That is a, a very big misconception as well. Yes, I know we push whole grains because we don't eat much of them, but it doesn't have to be whole grain all the time. If you can incorporate more of those whole grains, it's beneficial, but don't think it has to be all the time. Then a quarter of your plate is gonna be protein. So protein is gonna provide the amino acids or the building blocks for muscle for repair. So this is where protein is very, very important after surgery for that muscle repair to start happening. Um, as you start getting into your rehab, then we're going to start increasing the amount of carbohydrates that you're going to need. Your protein amount's essentially going to stay the same, but we're going to adjust that a little bit. And then you're going to want half of your plate to be fruits and vegetables. So the reason for fruits and vegetables, all the vitamins and minerals, they provide good for our body as well. So as I mentioned, as you progress through your rehab, then we're going to start, um, did the picture change? Or is it the same? It's nope, the same. still got the same one there. Okay. Okay. So as we're progressing through our rehabilitation, getting back into it, this is where our carbohydrate intake is going to increase. Now, I don't want you to freak out by the amount of food that this looks like. We simply broke it out into different plates just to give you an idea. But all of this can be on one plate. So what is what would it be on one plate? It's about a third of your plate is now carbohydrates, a quarter of it's still protein, and then the rest of it is fruits and vegetables. The other thing to keep in mind too is if you're somebody that I can't get my fruits and vegetables at my meals, we can incorporate those as snacks and that's okay too. Um, but we the important part is that we're getting for sure our carbs and our protein because we're definitely gonna need that. Then as we're working back into where we're almost full go in terms of my exercise is back to where I was before, um, or I'm going to start exercising a lot more, then our carbohydrate intake is about half our plate is carbs, a quarter of it's still protein, and then the rest of it's going to be fruits and vegetables. So the other thing after surgery uh, that we've done, that I've done in the athletic setting is the fish oil supplementation, as well as using either Juven or you could do arginine. So that's going to be the main amino acid that is important for healing, especially wound healing. So that is another supplement that could be added in if needed, especially if you feel like, I don't really get a lot of protein in general. Those are some specifics that we can add in to help meet your needs after surgery. Um, the other one I should add is also a multivitamin. So if you are someone that doesn't like a lot of fruits and vegetables, I usually do recommend a multivitamin for the fact of it's going to help close the gap between what you're getting from food and what you're not getting from food from that vitamin and mineral standpoint. How good of a trick is that in reality? <laughs> the multivitamin? Yes, because yeah. that's like my back pocket. I'm like, oh, I mean, I kind of messed up on my meals this week, but I got a whole jug of multivitamins. Let me pop a couple <laughs> of those and we're good to go. Yeah, I mean, if you're consistent with it, the other thing I tell people is it's going to give you more if you're taking it versus if you're not. So I just, I encourage you to be consistent. If you're very inconsistent with it, it's not going to be that beneficial. Fair enough. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, <laughs> uh, did you already answer kind of overall musculoskeletal health and how it impacts that? Do you feel like everything you mentioned there kind of incorporates that? Yeah, for the most part, I know there was one question specifically about iron and folate and that combination. So I personally have never heard that combination recommended. Now that could be a new finding that some of the surgeons are learning about and you know, being educated on as dietitians, we haven't been educated on that yet. And I haven't really seen much from a nutrition standpoint. However, as far as iron goes, iron deficiency is very common in a lot of people. And so again, keep in mind any specific supplementation like iron, vitamin D, vitamin B12, folic, or folate or folic acid. I never recommend any of those specifics without labs being drawn first just nice. because I, I don't feel comfortable right. um, saying go take this and then find out everything is fine. Um, so that would be something I would say if your doctor does recommend, Hey, go take some iron or gives, gives you some random individual item or vitamin, just ask, Hey, could I actually have some lab work done to verify that I need that versus it being recommended and then find out we don't need that. Or it's not sufficient it's not um, extremely low and we can actually increase our iron sources of food or 
maybe get outside a little bit more to help our vitamin D? What can we do from a food standpoint versus just relying on a supplement? Right. And I always like the checks and balance idea. So that's kind of clever. And, and doctors are always looking for data to make decisions too. So I like the, Hey, can I get some blood work to see how that looks? I, I've never thought about that. It's a basic answer. Mm -hmm. But where, where Kylie got that question was, I had a patient um, come in and ask or come in and mention iron and folate as a recommendation for what they were taking uh, before surgery and right after surgery. So uh, thanks for the input on that. Um, and, and again, and, I should add to that. Part of that recommendation could come from if the doctor suspicions there's a deficiency or there's been a history of deficiency, that may be where that might have come from. But sure, that's sure. it's not I guess it's not a common combination that I that I've heard or hear about. Awesome. And that's and I like the fact that you were at Hayes Med. I, I didn't even know you were at Hayes Med. So this just makes the whole thing even better. This is a slam dunk. <laughs> Um, and then the golden question that I got a lot when I was polling patients over the past week or so is uh, best diet to lose weight. Because a lot of times with back pain, there's like this generic number that 10% reduction in body weight can help back pain. So it's like best diet to lose weight. So me, I'm like, okay, calories in, calories out equation. Mm -hmm. What is it? 400 calories. What is that per, per, what is it per pound or 400 calories a day per pound, or how does that work out to be? A deficiency of 500 calories per day, essentially, um, is what it is. So it's a common question we all get is, or it's, I need to lose weight. What do I need to do? So one thing to keep in mind is everybody has a resting metabolic rate, and that is what your body needs to maintain daily function, whether you're active or not. If you are sufficiently below that whatever that level is, if you have this gap like this and you ride that gap initially, yeah, you might see some weight loss, but then you're going to see either weight gain or your weight's going to plateau. Um, and if, again, if we're not meeting those, your energies, your body's energy needs, then it's hard for us to even do anything else. So the best thing that I recommend people do to start with is going back to that very first plate that I showed you of a quarter of your plate is carbohydrates, a quarter is protein, and then half of it is fruits and vegetables, aiming for three meals a day. The other thing too is look at your serving plates. Do you have a really big plate? Because I know some dinner plates are very big now. Um, do you have a regular 12 inch plate like we normally had in the past? Um, and then also is there that little lip or that little ring around your plate? When you're filling your plate, aim to fill that inner ring. Don't feel clear to the edge of your plate. But also, if you're a family that likes to sit down and you do family style and everything's on the table, maybe try and leave things on the counter and then go sit down and eat your meal versus everything sitting right there in front of you. Or maybe looking at your serving utensil sizes. Is it a really large spoon that you don't need? Because it's all about perception. And going back to the bigger plates, if we have a bigger plate, research has shown we're going to give ourselves more food because if we're not filling our plate to us from a perception standpoint is we don't have enough food. The other thing is listen to your body. So when you're eating that plate, you have your carbs, your protein, your fruits and vegetables, slow down and listen to your body. And when you're full, stop eating and give yourself five to 10 minutes to let that food digest. If you're still hungry after five minutes, take a few more bites and maybe eat more fruits and vegetables versus going for the carbohydrate. Uh, but really listen to your body and don't just eat until it's gone because I've always been taught I have to clean my plate is what I hear a lot, but more, okay, I'm full. I'm realizing I don't need as much as what I thought I did. Um, so then, go ahead. It, so you're, you're not aiming for that 500 calorie deficit a day. You're aiming for habits. And then those habits typically translate into success. Is that kind of what you're. Correct. Correct. So I am very much a person of, I do not give out calorie levels hardly ever unless somebody is just very adamant because one negative with calorie levels is if it's a very type a person and I say you need 1850 calories a day and one day you're right on the next day maybe it's 1600 another day you're at 2000 then it becomes a numbers game and then it becomes stressful stress leads to weight gain versus weight loss and so then it comes becomes a vicious cycle and can honestly lead to some very disordered eating habits um, the other thing too is quality versus quantity so 
I could say, hey, aim for 500 calories at a meal. Well, 500 calories might be a cheeseburger and a small fry versus 500 calories could be two chicken breasts, a baked potato, a large salad, plus having a couple cocktails and some fruit. You and seriously so, know that off the top of your head? Is that about right? <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh, my God. That is, that's, like, man, that's accurate. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it would be pretty close to accurate, though. Um, and so that's the other thing, too, is quality versus quantity of what those calories look like. So really sit back and look at what is my lifestyle? How often am I eating out? Am I eating fruits and vegetables? Am I eating out of boredom when I get home in the evening? That's what I hear from a lot of people too is, well, I get home from work, I'm tired. I don't really want to do anything or I work out in the evening. I go home and then I sit down and I have a bag of chips or crackers or the snacks that we have or like candy or more junk food type items. So could we maybe put some fruits and vegetables out or think about how is your refrigerator arranged? And when you open your refrigerator, when we're hungry, our eyes are going to go directly to the first thing we see and, oh, that looks good. Maybe you had a dessert left over. I'm going to have some more dessert. Okay. How about we put the fruits and vegetables in that spot and we retrain our brain for what we want when we're hungry. Um, so really what's the best equation for weight loss? It's first is looking at our lifestyle and what is my nutrition and do I even focus on my nutrition but then second is I need to make sure I'm giving my body what it needs to even maintain its daily function before I can really focus on how do I adjust that to make weight changes. Nice. I, once again, simplicity is better than you're not worried about tracking stuff down. I feel like you got a basic equation in front of you that doesn't require a lot of um, anxiety and stress and counting and it allows you to tackle it with multiple colors and and shopping from the edge of the short store versus the middle and just taking those basic. Right. And the other thing too, is, you know, if you're tracking your intake, which I do have some, don't get me wrong. I've had some, some that are very successful with tracking their intake. And it was more of, I didn't realize I wasn't eating enough, or I didn't realize how much I was eating. Um, there is, it's the lose it app is the one that I've had the most success with that people have used. And a lot of people just tell me I had no idea what was in what I'm eating from like a fat standpoint, or it didn't have as much protein as they thought. And so it was more of an eye opener that way versus them actually looking at their calorie intake. Um, so that is definitely an option too. But the other thing that I like to talk to people about is the changes that we're trying to make are going to be lifestyle. So it's going to be lifelong versus I want to lose this weight and you focus on it for six months and make sacrifices, make changes for a short time. And then after that six months, well, I'm done with that. And then the weight comes back. Being well versus being um, in a phase and cycle. I, yeah, I like that. I preach that all the time. People come mm -hmm. in and I say, don't worry about being on a fad, worry about being well and everything else should come along. Yes. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Um, well, the next one I had there is link between um, diet and physical wellness. I think what I was getting at there was, do you find that people who are actively engaged in wanting to walk and be active tend to start to lean towards um, dietary wellness? And so, you know, your good intentions in one lead to good intentions in the other. Absolutely. And I think the, the biggest thing that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, right now I may have a type two diabetic come in and, hey, I I need to make some changes. You know, they finally decided I really need to get this under control. And once they realize that, oh, my changes in my physical activity, my changes in my eating have decreased my medication, I feel better, I'm losing weight, then it's like, yes, there is definitely a positive benefit. And obviously, we know the basics of diet and physical wellness help decrease the risk of heart disease, the risk of developing type two diabetes, weight gain, um, not contributing to the obesity epidemic that we're in right now. Um, so yes, there's a lot of benefits, but I have found, um, especially those that are more active and really want to be fit or have goals are more willing to engage in making sure their nutrition is in line. Or, yeah, just trying to mentally fix ourselves each day, whether it's diet and exercise or the 17 other things we're terrible at that we just fall into a trap. Right. Um, so is there any kind of, so if I want to, part of 
instead of like coffee, because me, I'm like a coffee guy, gets my energy going. What are some healthy food items that can get the energy boosted up um, right before maybe a rehab session or somebody who's trying to be active and exercise uh, versus our, um, I feel like society is pushing a supplement approach on that almost. Energy drinks, mm-hmm. you know, coffee, pops. What would you, is there any kind of food item you like for energy on? Yeah. So before a workout, you want to focus on carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are our main energy source for our brain and our body. And we can honestly aim for simple carbs at that point in time. So that could be if you're an athlete and you're into some of the athlete line, like the Gatorade chews, there's the honey stinger products, um, honey stinger chews or honey stinger waffles, a definitely fan favorite of the waffles, specifically the honey ones. Um, but there's also cliff blocks, but you could also buy like Welch's fruit snacks or Mott's fruit snacks going to do the same thing as the chews. How much? Like two packages, one package? I mean. Yeah. So it it depends on the product, like the cliff blocks. I want to say no more than three or four. They're a little bit dense. I wouldn't say denser. They're just bigger and you don't need the whole, they come in a tube. You don't need the whole tube. The honey stinger chews come in a pack of, I want to say there's like 15 chews in there. And I would suggest three or four to start with sometimes five or six to five or six, depending on the, your size. Now, if I'm working with like a football player, yeah, I'm going to tell him, go ahead and eat half that pack to start with. Don't eat the whole thing. Um, and then Gatorade choose the same thing. Even baseball players that wanted them, I told them, Hey, start with three or four. Don't eat the whole thing at, at once. Now, another option too, is you could do four ounces of like Gatorade or Powerade. Yes, there's some sugars there, but you're wanting the carbohydrates. You're wanting that for your body because that's going to help you. That's going to give you that energy. Other options. I mean, if you want to do like a half a piece of fruit or like a banana, um, or you could do just some apple or another easy thing is the little individual fruit cups, like the mandarin oranges, the peaches, the pears, something simple like that. Um, Or a piece of toast if it's in the morning, just something that's going to be easily digested in your body. If you're someone that's very nervous before your workout and you don't really feel like you can eat a lot, I tend to go towards, okay, let's drink like four ounces of a sports drink or get something in your body just so you're not going into it on an empty stomach. Nice. I like all that. That's simple. I running track at Emporia State, I constantly felt like I was going to puke. And so I like I can blame and attribute things, but it's like, man, I just never did any of that. So it would have been nice to see if I could have yes. shaved it for a second off or a half second off a race there yes. um, with that. Um, the other golden question, how much water should we be drinking? I feel like that's all over Google, but I've never asked somebody with a degree, and I'm all about <laughs> asking people a degree. So what about water intake? Water intake, general rule of thumb, half your body weight in fluid ounces. So just an easy calculation. If you're a 200-pound person, you want to aim for 100 ounces of fluid. Now, it might sound like a lot, and I get that, but any fluid you take in, so whether it's milk, juice, coffee, tea, water, anything you drink from a fluid standpoint is going to go towards that total ounces per day. The other thing, too, is fruits and vegetables are going to break down to water in our body. So if you're eating like a cup of fruit, a cup of vegetables at a meal, it's going to break down to about two to three ounces of fluid. So if you really want to get technical about calculate every little thing that you take in from a fluid standpoint, you can count that as well. But like I said, general rule of thumb, half your body weight in fluid ounces is what you're aiming for. So has uh, Stanley released a uh, hundred fluid ounce mug yet? So <laughs> I haven't like the seen market's one. There, you can rename it. Yeah, I don't know what you can name, but you have a hundred ounce Stanley cup. Uh, yeah, so I know. All the fitness junkie. That'd be an instant sell. I know for sure. That's for funny. sure. Um, Cool. So yeah, big one here, supplements versus actual food. And then I teared it off to healing the body and then through some tips and tricks, but you've already crushed all these answers and questions so well. I'm going to let you run with the last tab there. All right. So supplements is a big topic. Um, Unfortunately, supplement world is taking over. Um, And from a nutrition standpoint, it's a little frustrating sometimes because supplements are pushed. And if it's a younger athlete, I found a lot of times of, oh, I want to take this because my idol's taking it, or I follow somebody on social media that's taking it and they look this way. So I want to look like that. First thing to remember with supplements is if you're following somebody that is your idol, nothing wrong with that. Don't have an issue with it. 
But keep in mind, their genetics are different. Their training is completely different. Maybe they have a chef that you have no idea about. And maybe they're promoting one supplement and they were probably taking 10 to 12 more supplements to look the way they do. So one thing I do encourage young athletes to do is actually look at the profiles of the people they're following. And do you actually feel like you know that person versus you just see this picture and that's what they look like. So I should look like that. Right. So that is one thing with supplements. Now, supplements are meant to supplement a balanced intake. So when it comes to supplements, there is a time and place that I will right off the bat say, hey, yeah, let's go ahead and start this versus, hey, I need you to prove to me that your nutrition, your hydration, your sleep, all the components are in, in line and you're actually doing it before I will let you start taking a supplement. The other thing with supplements, and I'm going to show you some labels here, is you want to make sure that your supplements are third party tested. So the reason for this is if you do not see one of these three labels, so we have um, the gold standard banned substance control group, NSF is actually the gold standard for third-party testing, and then inform, informed choice trusted by sport. If you're looking at a supplement, which pro tip, you're not going to find any of these at GNC, so let's just not shop there. Um but if you do not see any of those labels on your supplement, I strongly discourage you from taking that for the fact of a supplement that's third-party tested has gone through rigorous testing so that what is listed on the label is actually in the supplement versus... What percent of, if you just guess, what percent of supplements and stuff out there have not been tested? 99%? Uh, I would guess probably 80 to 90 percent. Oh, man, that's scary. All right. I didn't given, mean to throw you off topic. I had to ask that. <laughs> given how many supplements are out there, and I know I don't even know of all the supplements there is or there are, but I want to say probably 80 to 90 haven't been even close to tested. The other component of that, too, is some companies will sell a third party tested supplement while also tell, selling supplements that are not third party tested. So that's the other thing too, is I have a pretty good idea of who those companies are and don't ask me to name them off right now, but um, I will tell people just to be leery, just for the fact of they're being made in the same factory, the same place. So there's a chance that there is some cross contamination, um, but you do want to make sure it's third party tested just for your safety, especially if you're an athlete and you're subject to drug testing, you don't want to test positive on a drug test. So that is something to be aware of for supplements. Now, supplements are also protein powders, multivitamins, anything that we take that supplements our intake essentially is considered a supplement. So another one that is big is energy drinks. So kind of going back to your question about before a workout, what could I do? I know the big energy drink right now is Celsius. Strongly discouraged people from drinking that especially athletes. Again, it does contain a banned substance. So um, I strongly discourage that. I discourage bang for sure. Um, and then also the other component of those is the high caffeine amount in those. So working in the clinical setting and seeing a lot of heart patients, I will tell you in all of my years as being a dietitian and being in the hospital, I have seen a couple people come in that were taking in very high amounts of caffeine. And guess what? have a heart issue. So the other thing to keep in mind is when you're taking in that much caffeine, what is it doing to your heart? Causing your heart to beat excessively fast, right? And that's going to happen for a short period of time. And then it goes back to normal. But if we do that multiple times, our heart can only take so much. It can't, it can't do that all the time. Um, so that's why I, I suggest avoiding the energy drinks. The only one that is third party tested is Red Bull. So if you're a Red Bull Interesting. fan. Interesting. All out. right. They figured um, that out. Yes. Now, from like a protein powder standpoint, just because I get this one a lot. Um, again, protein powder, I don't ever want to take away the benefit of protein from food and put in a protein powder. If you aren't paying attention to what you're doing, you might get a protein powder or you might be looking and, hey, this got 50 grams of protein. I think I should probably take that. Not necessarily the case. 
again, depending on the size of the individual, your protein needs are going to vary and how much your body can break down is going to vary. So general rule of thumb, I would look for one that's got like 20, 25 grams of protein in it. Um, there's also going to be higher carbohydrate ones. There's going to be lower carbohydrate ones. So they're a little bit leaner. And then the other thing too, creatine is a huge, hey, I want to take creatine because I want to get big. I want to get strong, right? Creatine, creatine monohydrate is the best form of creatine. Now, the other thing too, is there used to be the loading and unloading phase of creatine. I don't know if you're familiar with that or if you've heard of that. But research is now showing that we just need the maintenance phase, and that is essentially five grams of creatine monohydrate daily. Um, I've had a lot of younger kids ask recently if they can take creatine. I usually don't recommend it until at least high school, just for the fact that their body is still changing. Um, or if it's someone that has not focused on nutrition at all, you can bet I'm not going to allow somebody to take creatine that hasn't focused on their nutrition. Um, as I mentioned before, other supplements like the fish oil, the juven, the arginine for wound healing, for healing after surgery, that is definitely something to consider. Um, but supplements are one of those things we could probably talk about for a long time, given sure. there's so many and every one of them really has a different purpose or a different point that they would be appropriate. Nice. Um, there's a lot of good stuff on there. I feel like even just not even on supplements, nutrition and stuff and, and what specific angle and question people may have with that. You could go on forever. Um, I struggled even coming up with trying to make it a short list in half an hour. And clearly I messed that up because we're still rolling. Um, <laughs> good. No, I think you gave tons of good information. Hopefully somebody finds help out of this. I know I get these questions all the time and I feel like I'm educated a little bit better to give people feedback. And then now I, I'm going to have a better email address, phone number, and website because I'm going to kick them right over to you. What's what's a good what's a good phone number, website, email address? Somebody can get a hold of you out here in Kansas to get some input and advice on some of these things when they really feel like they need it. Yep, I am actually going to put that on the screen here for you. Um, so you can either call or text my cell phone here at the bottom. Um, I will say text is usually a better form of communication for me. Uh, and then my email is listed. I also have a website. Um, to be quite honest with you, I haven't quite kept up the website or my social media page as much as I had planned to. But when when the K-squared performance is kind of my side thing right now, it's not that I totally negate it by any means, but putting that information out there is just not where I found it to be my top priority right now. Uh, but there is, I do have quite a bit of information on there from when I did start. And so for somebody that's just looking to get started or has no idea where to start, there's a lot of beginner information available there for them. Um, so yeah, any of these contact or any of these ways listed that I have for contact information, you can get a hold of me. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or help anybody out the best that I can. Yeah, I mean, what, what a wealth of knowledge somebody who's gone through, just like I said, out in Western Kansas, multiple avenues of this and that, hospital, athletes, everything, and then having that higher level degree with that. I've found that the more people that encourage me to get certifications and stuff, just more knowledge comes with it. And I can tell you just you use it and you love it, and people are going to really benefit from that going on. So I think that's awesome you're serving us out here in Western Kansas. Yeah, good old Western Kansas, right? <laughs> Well, cool, Kylie. Anything else you feel like you want to add uh, for the greater cause here, the greater good? No, the, the thing I would say is if you're somebody that's looking for like, hey, I, I need to, it's the beginning of a new year. I get it. We're in February, but it's not too late to take care of your nutrition. But if you're somewhere you're lost, you have no idea where to even start. What I would say is make a list of things that you would like to improve in your life. Make a list of short-term goals and long-term goals and look at from a nutrition standpoint, is there something that I could change? And if there is, try to focus on that one thing for a couple weeks. Maybe it takes you a month and that's perfectly fine, but just try and focus on that change and make it gradual because what a lot of people do, and I think a lot of it is society today, is we have to change everything. We have to do it now. We don't want to really take the time to make those changes. So take the time and whether it's, I'm going to make five extra minutes 
you know, a day. I'm going to do that for myself, or I'm going to set aside 20 minutes on the weekend to start meal prepping, or even just planning out my meal so I know what I'm having. Um, just think about what small change could I do for myself, and who knows, might lead to more energy than you would have ever thought. Uh, and that is something that I don't think a lot of people realize is their nutrition is actually negatively impacting their energy level throughout the day, or even their ability to function or think if it's in class or if they get brain fog at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, are we looking at, have you had a good sleep pattern? I will say that is something else that I touch on because I have a lot of young athletes that stay up late playing games and then don't go to bed early, don't get much sleep that negatively impacts performance. It also negatively impacts weight loss. And so we want to look at all of those aspects. And I just really challenge you to look at what am I doing and what could I change? What can I commit to that's going to make me better? Um, and speaking from a clinical standpoint, what change is also going to help prevent me from having a lot of medical bills down the road? Um, that's the reality of some things is we can make changes now and prevent a lot of excess hospital, ER, doctor visits down the road, or even having to take blood pressure medication, diabetes medication, whatever it is, what could I do now so that I'm not faced with those high expenses later down the road? Well, there you have it. Kylie Keller, um, infinite guru on all things health there with food and nutrition. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's going to do somebody a lot of good, I hope. And uh, thanks for sharing everything you got there. Yeah. Thanks for having me.